11 Job rebuked so these three men ceased to answer Job, because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu the son of Barachel the Buzit, of the kindred of Ram, against Job was his wrath kindled, because he justified himself rather than God. Job 32, 1-2 Chapter 32 is a transition from the conversation of Job with his three hard-hearted, ignorant, and pharisaical friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zaphar, to Elihu's discourse. The author concludes the conversation and makes some very revealing statements about what took was spoken. Job put his three friends to silence by arguing his case for innocence very effectively. He won the case because they could not answer him any further. Hence, Job remained righteous in his own eyes. Job maintained the stand that since he was innocent, God had no right to afflict him. Job concludes. God is unjust in his dealings because he destroys the righteous and the wicked alike. Job 9, 22, Elihu was angry with Job because he counted himself righteous and God unrighteous. Also against Job's three friends was Elihu's anger kindled, because they had found no answer were unable to show his real error, and yet they had declared him to be in the wrong and responsible for his own afflictions. But when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouths of these three men, he became angry. Job 32, 3, 5 Amp, Elihu was also angry at Job's three friends, since they had brought the allegations against Job which they could not prove. The allegations were actually false. They only made matters worse and made Job bitter toward God. Such people are still found today, who are sinmongers, they smell sin where there is none. They wrongly spoke that God is judging some sin in Job's life, when God was not the one doing it. It was Satan who brought the evil, which also was without a cause. This is what Elihu, son of Barakal the Buzit, said, I'm a young man, and you are all old and experienced. That's why I kept quiet and held back from joining the discussion. I kept thinking, experience will tell. The longer you live, the wiser you become. But I see I was wrong it's God's spirit in a person, the breath of the Almighty One, that makes wise human insight possible. The experts have no corner on wisdom, getting old doesn't guarantee good sense. So I've decided to speak up. Listen well. I'm going to tell you exactly what I think. Job 32, 6-10 Message, Elihu's speech is recorded in chapters 32-37. The focus of Elihu's discourse was to declare that God is never unrighteous. If Job perceives that God had dealt unjustly with him, that was an error. God does injustice to none. Elihu picks up some statements Job makes against God and answers them. Surely you have spoken in my hearing, and I have heard the voice of your words, saying, I am clean, without transgression, I am innocent, neither is there iniquity in me. But behold, God finds occasions against me and causes of alienation and indifference, he counts me as his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks, he untrustingly watches all my paths you say. I reply to you, behold, in this you are not just, God is superior to man. Job 33, 8-12 Amp, Elihu declares to Job that his accusations against God are not true and that in doing so, Job is not justified. Elihu is saying, God is superior to man. God does not do injustice, but his work is to deliver man from the misery of his ways. The rest of the passage describes how man digs a pit for himself and how God desires to send a messenger. By hearkening to the messenger, men can be delivered. In chapter 33 Elihu describes God's work as redemption, not destruction. This is the way God works. Over and over again he pulls our souls back from certain destruction so we'll see the light and live in the light. Job 33, 29-30 Message the following is another accusation against the Lord by Job, which Elihu proceeds to rebuke. For Job has said, I am innocent and uncompromisingly righteous, but God has taken away my right, would I lie against my right? Yet, notwithstanding my right, I am 
counted a liar. My wound is incurable, though I am without transgression. Job 34, 5 to 6 Amp, for he has said, It profits a man nothing that he should delight himself with God and consent to him. Job 34, 9 Amp, for Job has said, I am innocent and uncompromisingly righteous, but God has taken away my right, would I lie against my right? Yet, notwithstanding my right, I am counted a liar. My wound is incurable, though I am without transgression. Job 34, 5 to 6 Amp, for he has said, It profits a man nothing that he should delight himself with God and consent to him. Job 34, 9 Amp, here Job alleges though he was innocent and righteous, that God had denied him his rights. Job goes to the extreme to say that to delight oneself in God is vain. We see Job asserting his righteousness again and again and no mention or plea for grace or mercy based on God's goodness. Therefore hear me, you men of understanding. Far be it from God that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should commit iniquity. Job 34, 10 Amp, Truly God will not do wickedly, neither will the Almighty pervert justice. Job 34, 12 Amp, Is it possible that an enemy of right should govern? And will you condemn him who is just and mighty? Job 34, 17 Amp, God is not partial to princes, nor does he regard the rich more than the poor, for they all are the work of his hands. Job 34, 19 Amp, in the above we see Elihu's refutation to Job's former statements. Elihu maintains that the Almighty does not commit iniquity by denying rights to a just man, neither does he pervert justice as Job had alleged. He reasons by saying, it is not possible for an enemy of right to govern the world rightly. The Lord is not partial, therefore we cannot say he picks and chooses to punish certain people. Elihu further declares although, it's true that God is all-powerful, but he doesn't bully innocent people. Job 36, 5 Message, He never takes his eyes off the righteous, he honors them lavishly, promotes them endlessly. Job 36, 7 Message, Elihu makes this wonderful statement that God blesses and honors people lavishly. That is exactly what God had been doing in Job's life until Satan brought destruction. Blessing, peace, and prosperity has been the work of the Lord from the beginning, yet Job thought God was trying to destroy him. Job had made some horrible statements like the one Elihu quotes, Elihu spoke further to Job and said, Do you think this is your right, or are you saying, My righteousness is more than God's? Job 35, 1-2 Amp, What a terrible mindset Job had gotten into. Job was actually cursing God in a sense. Blessing means to speak well of someone or praise them. Cursing simply means to speak bad about, negatively or malign someone. In this sense Job was indeed cursing God. We have seen the many horrible and self-centered allegations Job had leveled against the good Lord. By doing so, Job was beginning to sink more into sin. It is true initially Job did not sin or accuse God, but he did so later on. Would that Job's afflictions be continued and he be tried to the end because of his answering like wicked men? For he adds rebellion in his unsubmissive, defiant attitude toward God to his unacknowledged sin, he claps his hands in open mockery and contempt of God among us, and he multiplies his words of accusation against God. Job 34, 36-37 Amp Elihu said that Job was making matters worse for himself by sinning against the Lord by accusing him of something he had not done. In doing so, Job was not any better than a wicked person. He was as ungodly as any sinner. For this wickedness of Job, Elihu wishes that Job must suffer more. In refuting the words Job had said, Elihu affirms twice. That Job is speaking, without wisdom and knowledge. He is saying things for which he has not basis, neither understanding. The Message Bible calls Job, an ignoramus, who talks utter nonsense. Job 34, 35 Message, Job hath spoken without knowledge, and his words were without wisdom. Job 34, 
35, Therefore doth Job open his mouth in vain, he multiplieth words without knowledge. Job 35, 16, Job, you talk sheer nonsense non-stop nonsense. Job 35, 16 message, a point worth noting is that Job did not talk back or argue with any of Elihu's statements, though he did with his other friends. Job is beginning to understand a few things here. Moreover, the above cited verses makes it clear that Job's words about God are neither true, nor a safe guide to build a doctrine. The Lord repeats the same words concerning Job's babbling when he appears on the scene in chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, and said, Who is this that darkneth counsel by words without knowledge? Job 38, 1-2 the Message Bible translates the second verse as, Why do you confuse the issue? Why do you talk without knowing what you're talking about? Indeed, Job had no knowledge about God. He was just going by the human, carnal, wisdom and reasoning. Both Elihu and the Lord confronted Job's words and said they were without knowledge. Job demanded God to appear to answer his charges. Job wanted to know where God dwells so that he might go there and confront him to learn why he was afflicting him. Job wanted to take God to court. Now, finally he was face to face with the Lord. Pull yourself together, Job. Up on your feet. Stand tall. I have some questions for you, and I want some straight answers. Job 38, 3 Message Where were you when I created the earth? Tell me, since you know so much. Job 38, 4 Message, Have you comprehended the breadth of the earth? Tell me, if you know it all. Job 38, 18 Amp, Since Job had presumed to know why these things were happening to him, the Lord simply started asking Job questions. The questions were to bring Job to the understanding that he does not know everything. Rather, Job knew nothing of why things had happened. The Lord questions Job regarding many things, which can be found in chapters 38 and 39. God then confronted Job directly, Now what do you have to say for yourself? Are you going to haul me, the Mighty One, into court and press charges? Job 40, 1-2 Message, Do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You are God's critic, but do you have the answers? Job 40, 2 NLT after bringing Job to his senses, his right mind, the Lord is in essence saying, Do you see how little you know? And you want to condemn me of doing these things to you, as if you are all-knowing. To which Job replies, Behold, I am of small account and vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand upon my mouth. I have spoken once, but I will not reply again indeed, twice have I answered, but I will proceed no further. Job 40, 4-5 Amp, Wow! What a change! The self-righteous man, who bragged about his innocence and righteousness through more than 30 chapters of the book, now says, I am of small account and vile. Job was brought to repentance not by punishment, but by words. God chastised Job by words of correction, not by whips. God's word brings light. God does not chasten us by suffering but by his word and spirit. Job was able to see where he missed it. Job refused to speak any more, lest more ignorance is poured out of his mouth. Then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind, and said, Gird up thy loins now like a man, I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me, that thou mayest be righteous? Job 40, 6-8, let us see the last verse in a few other translations. Will you discredit my justice and condemn me just to prove you are right? Job 40, 8 NLT, will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Job 40, 8 ESV, do you presume to tell me what I'm doing wrong? Are you calling me a sinner so you can be a saint? Job 40, 8 Message, Job's logic was since he had not lived a lifestyle of sin, he was a righteous man. If Job was righteous, 
then he does not deserve what happened to him. Therefore, if any person was in the wrong, it was the Lord. Job believed that both good and evil come from the Lord. This is the exact mindset that the Lord is refuting here. The Lord simply is questioning the veracity of such a logic and the audacity Job has to condemn a righteous God. In the following statements, the Lord talks about his exceeding great might. Who then is able to stand against me? Job 41, 10, the inference is that if the Lord were to come against Job, he would be wiped out. Job was not wiped out. That is proof enough that God's not guilty. Then Job said to the Lord, I know that you can do all things, and that no thought or purpose of yours can be restrained or thwarted. Job 42, 1-2 Amp, Job understood because of the exceeding greatness of the Lord, if he decides to do something, he can do it. Job sees that nothing can withhold the counsel or the hand of God. Hence, he decides to repent of all that he had spoken earlier against the Lord. You said to me who is this that darkens and obscures counsel by words without knowledge? Therefore I now see I have rashly uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Job 42, 3 Amp, Job said now I see, indicating he did not see before. He had uttered things he did not understand. Things too wonderful for him, which he did not know. We must also repent if we have used Job's words as justification for blaming God of any evil. Job just recanted of all he had blamed the Lord. If he has renounced his words, we cannot use them anymore. People have given heed to the words of hurting men, rather than the healing words of the Lord. I had virtually said to you what you have said to me here, I beseech you, and I will speak, I will demand of you, and you declare to me. I had heard of you only by the hearing of the ear, but now my spiritual eye sees you. Job 42, 4-5 Amp Job is humbling himself before the Lord. It might have been difficult for a self-righteous man to do it. But when God exposes the lies of the devil and we see the truth, we must immediately repent. Job confesses he had only known God through what he heard someone say. Like grandma's fables, as we would call them, or the traditions of the elders, which were passed down. But now Job saw God speaking to him directly. When he saw the truth of God, he was overwhelmed. Read what he did next. Therefore I loathe my words and abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job 42, 6 Amp, Job repented. However, he did not just repent. He abhorred himself for what all he had accused the Lord. He repented in dust and ashes. Job will not be responsible for our folly, because the record of the Bible shows him recanting of his words. It shows Job humbling himself before the Lord and repenting. Job wanted God to be judged in court, but God vindicated himself as the scripture says, that you may be justified and shown to be upright in what you say, and prevail when you are judged by sinful men. Rom. 3, 4 Amp, let me say it again, if Job's previous view was true that, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away, and that, the Lord was the one bringing affliction on him, then Job would have had nothing to repent of. Selah. After the Lord had spoken the previous words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore take seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer that I deal not with you after your folly, in that you have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zafar the Namathite went and did as the Lord commanded them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Job 42, 7-9 Amp, Job repented, but his friends did not. The Lord rebuked them for their wrong sayings against him. In his mercy he provided them a way out of their folly. He commanded them to offer a burnt offering and have Job pray for them. Else, 
the devil might have had occasion against them to destroy them too. How gracious is the Lord here in preserving the offenders! In that you have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job has, refers to the words of repentance and submission which Job spoke in chapters 38 to 42. It is not referring to chapters prior to 38 because then God would be unjust according to Job's words. The good news is, God accepted Job's prayer for his friends. It reinstated Job's honor in front of his friends and the society. God honored a man who had been accusing him of being unjust and said he was trying to kill him. That is grace. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job and restored his fortunes, when he prayed for his friends, also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Job 42, 10 Amp, the Lord turned the captivity of Job. This statement reveals Job was in captivity. He was not the Lord's captive. We know who had taken him captive. It is the devil who snares people and takes them captive. 2 Tim. 2, 26, however, the Lord's role here is described as one who turned around the captivity and set Job free. Jesus declared it as his mission statement when he said, He has sent me on a mission to proclaim release to those held captive. LK. 4, 18 Woost, Deliverance and release come from the Lord. The phrase, Restored his fortunes, states the Lord restored the possessions Job had lost. The Lord did not restore the possessions because of Job's goodness. It must have been clear to Job by this time. The Lord gives by grace. It was when Job obeyed by praying for his miserable friends that he positioned himself to receive God's grace. The Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. This was unwarranted. The double blessing was neither needed or deserved by Job. Job did nothing to deserve double restoration. Peter said in his letter, For God resistateth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. 1 Pet. 5, 5 6, that is exactly what Job did at the end. He repented and humbled himself to receive grace. The Lord is known to make our cup run over, P.S.A. 23, 5. He is El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough. In consistency with his nature, the Lord just blessed him by giving him double so that his latter end was more glorious. Then came there unto him all his brethren, and all his sisters, and all they that had been of his acquaintance before, and did eat bread with him in his house, and they bemoaned him, and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him, every man also gave him a piece of money, and every one an earring of gold. Job 42, 11, the evil mentioned is clearly a reference to the great loss Job suffered. He lost his health, wealth, and children. By this time we know the Lord is not the one who caused it. Job knew it and his three friends came to know it. However, these people missed the encounter and revelation. They were only there to seize the opportunity, after the restoration, to express their sorrow for Job and offer their handouts to comfort him. Paul Ellis has the following to say about the verse. The verse as stated is not offering God's mindset, and the author is not attempting to state that God brought trouble on Job. The author is merely relaying the perspective of the people being referenced that he is writing about. That makes sense to me and seems the best way to explain to people that God's word is not confirming that God brings trouble or evil on us. A God who does evil makes as much sense as a torch that shines dark. It always helps to know who's being quoted. So when Solomon says money is the answer to everything in Ecclesiastes, I don't interpret that as the Lord teaching us to put our faith in money. 11 These are the people Job described as being deceitful or unreliable, as a desert stream. Job 6, 15, they were nowhere to be seen when he was under affliction. We all might have known such people in our lives. Those who are only seen when things are going good. Who needs friends only when all is well. A friend in need is a friend indeed.
These friends of Job were not seen when he was burying his children or when he sat on a dunghill and scratched his sore boils. At least the other three friends came and sat with him, even if only to make matters worse. As soon as God restored Job's fortunes, these people appear on the scene, all his brothers, sisters, and all his former acquaintances. There is something wicked in what they did next. They bemoaned and comforted him over all the evil the Lord had brought on him. That belief was the mindset in the age or period in which Job lived. There was no occasion for their behavior. Job was happy now. God had comforted him and restored his fortunes. This is ludicrous. These people are sitting in a mansion surrounded by the blessings of God. They are literally feasting on the Lord's provision, yet in between mouthfuls they bemoan the evil of a God who kills and takes away. They were not around when Job was hurting. They knock on his door as soon as he is rich, and they paint evil pictures of a good God. Thank God by the end of the story, Job had a better perspective about the Lord and their false accusations against the Lord would not affect him any longer. The funniest part is after God has restored Job, they wanted to give him money and gold earrings. Please make note that this contribution did not make Job twice as rich as before. In view of the double provision of God, this contribution was nothing. It is possible it was some kind of custom to give a piece of money and gold earrings. This is how the story of Job concludes. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He had also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first Jemima, and the name of the second Kezia, and the name of the third Karen Hapuch. And in all the land there were no women so fair as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them inheritance among their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years, and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even to four generations. So Job died, an old man and full of days. Job 42, 12 to 17 Amp, Job received twice as much possessions. The Lord blessed him with the exact number of sons and daughters. These daughters were extremely beautiful. Job gave all his children an inheritance. The Bible says, A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. Pro. 13, 22. The initial and the latter stage of Job's life describes a blessed man and it was the Lord blessing him. Job lived out his life to the full, a happy old man who lived to see four generations. That is called being blessed. Whatever evil happened to Job was not the Lord's doing. God desired to bring him to an expected end, which is peace and prosperity. Ja. 29, 11, the next chapter is where we get a clear picture of the Lord's plan and purposes. James, in his letter described it as, the end of the Lord, because God has his way in bringing Job to an expected end.